Hey, everybody. Welcome to Uncomfortable, where the goal is to have honest and unflinching conversations about the issues that seem to divide us as Americans. I'm Amna Nawaz. Each week, we're going to feature a one-on-one -on -one interview with a special guest to learn more about what they believe and also why they believe what they do. With me today is Jared Taylor, the founder of the New Century Foundation and American Renaissance, its associated publication. Mr. Taylor, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's fair to say you focus your work on race, on racial issues, uh, mostly in America, specifically around uh, the issue of white pride, as you call it. Is that accurate? Well, uh, white pride is not an expression I frequently use. What um, is the, How do you characterize your work? It can be divided in two areas. One is race realism, and race realism is the recognition that race is a biological fact. It's a phenomenon. It's not some sort of sociological construct, which is the trendy way of viewing things. No, it's part of biology, and it's also part of individual and group identity. And societies ignore the importance of biology and group identity at their peril. The other aspect of my work is white advocacy. That is, we speak for the interests of whites as a group. Every other racial group in the United States has organizations, publications, even congressional caucuses that look out for their interests, and whites should have the same thing. So, yes, uh, race realism and white advocacy are my business. It's fair to say you believe your white identity and the identity of many white Americans is under attack. It's obviously under attack. Uh, whites are That's supposed the way to, you feel. Yes. Uh, whites are supposed to feel guilty about this alleged unearned white privilege that they're supposed to be beneficiaries of. We're supposed to sort of tug our forelocks and apologize for the past. Essentially, whites are blamed for everything that goes wrong for non-whites, not just in the United States, but basically around the world. So, Mr. Tell, you've, mm. you've obviously you've written about this extensively. You've written a number of books. You host conferences on these topics. Um, the beliefs that you hold are uh, discredited by a number of different think tanks and uh, academic institutions and studies. But it's fair to say that you hold these beliefs and a number of other Americans hold these beliefs. They've never been and, discredited. People uh, yell about them, but they've never been discredited. Discredited What I'd like to, to do, Mr. Taylor, if you incorrect. don't mind, I think yes, it's fair so. to say anyone who knows mm -hmm. anything about my work or yours can say that we come uh, to the world with very different viewpoints. And so you have a number of platforms on which you express your views and you argue your views. Um, and what I'm more interested in talking about today is I, I don't, I'm not going to change your mind. You're not going to change mine. What I'd like to talk about is how you came to believe what you believe to be true today, if that's all right. Oh, certainly. Great. Uh, I used to be very much a racial egalitarian, probably in the mold of someone like yourself. Well, let's that start at the a, beginning, if you don't mind. Because I will say, and one of the mm -hmm. things I found about you that I think would surprise a lot of people is that you spent many of your formative years abroad. Is that's that right? Correct. You were mm -hmm. raised mostly in Japan as that's a child. Correct. Tell yes. me about that. My parents were missionaries. I was born in Japan. I lived there till I was 16 years old. So the first 16 years of my life, I was a racial minority. But that really didn't affect my thinking about race at all. Wait, my so parents no, I, were, just, I no. just want to back you up for a second here. Because I'd like to make this a conversation, if sure. you don't mind. And I, I understand you've talked right. about this before. But there are parts of this that I just find fascinating. Because uh, I, you can't have been one of many young white children. No, we were your, the only honkies for miles around. You were the only white family. So you must have stood out in school? Of course. Of Did course. you have any other white friends, any friends in no, other... No, there weren't any other white people around. So tell me, just going back to that time in your life, because those are incredibly formative years. That's the majority of your childhood, right? Yes. That's where... It's my entire childhood. It's your entire childhood. It's where, you know, I'm thinking back to my childhood, too. That's where you start to s sort of self-identify in a certain way, start to see yourself in relation to your community and to other people and to your community members. What was that like for you? Did you experience discrimination as a white a minority amount, there? Sure, a what certain kind? amount of discrimination. Oh, well, I was uh, physically larger than my classmates. And uh, where I grew up, a man or a boy had no status at all unless he was prepared to get into fist fights. And there was some sort of uh, credit in uh, overpowering the larger white guy. And so I had to do a, lot, a fair amount of fist fighting in order to establish my status. But that was just part of the way things worked there. So you were physically and, uh, bullied, though? 
Not really. It was not such so much bullying. Bullying. It was just that in order to establish yourself in the pecking order, you had to be prepared to fight. And I was not going to be an utterly statusless loser, so I was prepared to fight. But don't get me wrong. Uh, I have very, very fond memories of my childhood. I made many fast friends who were friends to this day. But as the friends only friends with other Japanese kids. Yes, yes, yeah. they're all Japanese. Mm-hmm. As the only Caucasian, of course, I attracted a certain amount of attention. Some of it desirable, some of it undesirable. Mm-hmm. But I wish to emphasize that, believe it or not, this had no effect on my understanding of race. My parents were liberal. I went to a very liberal university after I left Japan. And it was only in my late 20s and 30s that I began to arrive at a dissident view of race. Well, tell me about this. You mentioned your parents were liberal. What did they teach you? Uh, I know I, you know I inherited a lot of my ideas about the values of diversity and and racial equality and the way the world in its ideal form would work from my parents, from my family. What did your parents teach you? Their view was that race was an insignificant, if in fact a biological concept, but that we were all children of God and that it was wrong to draw any conclusions on the basis of race and that there was no reason to think that the United States should remain a majority white country. They had utterly typical egalitarian views, as did I. And as I say, it was only as a consequence of studying these things, traveling, reading about history, reading about biology, that I came to the dissident views that I hold today. You went on to travel. You lived in um, France for some time, am I right? Three years. For three years in Paris? That's right. Um, You've also traveled in West Africa? For about a year and a half. For about a year and a half. What were you doing there? Vagabonding. Vagabonding. Yes. What does that entail? That means uh, hitchhiking, uh, sleeping rough, uh, begging a bed wherever I could. Uh, My purpose in going to West Africa was to have a look around and also to speak as little English or Japanese as possible. So I spoke only French for sometimes six months at a time. And you are still, you're fluent in Japanese and French today. That's correct. correct? Um, What did you, uh, what did you learn from your travels. You said, you know, later in life you came to hold these views more strongly that you hold today about white identity and about the place of whites in society. I never held those views at all until my late 20s or 30s. It wasn't a question of holding them strongly. Mm -hmm. But I will give you an example of one of my experiences. I had been in the Ivory Coast, which was very heavily colonized by the French. Mm -hmm. And it was doing extremely well. It was called the Japan of West Africa because it was doing so well. Well, I went overland from Ivory Coast to Liberia, which is a neighboring country. And as soon as I crossed the border, it was just a remarkable difference. The roads were full of potholes. The buildings were tumbled down. The Ivorians were well-dressed. Liberians were dressed in rags. And I went to the University of Liberia, and I asked one of the students there, I said, I don't mean to be rude, but why is it that your country is such a mess and Ivory Coast is doing so well? He said, that's an easy question to answer. We didn't have the benefits of colonization. Now, that was during my first visit to West Africa, and at that time, I was very much a liberal. I was staggered by this. I'd thought of colonization as some sort of exploitative undertaking, that Europeans had extracted all the juices out of these countries. For him, it was obvious. Colonization was a wonderful thing for Ivory Coast, and that's why it was doing so well. Liberia had not been colonized. It was founded by freed American slaves, and that's why it was a mess. So you took away from that that colonization was actually a benefit to the countries in which it was imposed? He certainly thought so, and I thought... As an African, his point of view was certainly worth considering, but it rather staggered me because I had the conventional view that colonization was not a benefit. That was just well, one I'll also little. Point out, that was just one little. I'll also step point out, Mr. Taylor, the, the French way of colonizing was vastly different from the way that the British colonized, from the way the Italians colonized, from the way the Germans colonized. The French, as I'm sure you know, colonized in the idea that where we land and where we establish our regime is basically an extension of France, right? Which no, is not the way that the uh, British did. Which is not the way the that the Germans is, or Italians did. The point is, there was colonization, European influence, as opposed to no European influence. Mm-hmm. In Africa, those places that were least colonized, namely Liberia or, for example, Ethiopia, they are the most poverty-stricken places on 
the entire continent. Those places that were most heavily colonized, if you wish, those where whites went to live in large numbers, South Africa, or at the time, Rhodesia. Those are the parts of Africa that were doing the best. Those that were left to their own devices are the ones that are doing the worst. And this is what this man was saying. But you look at example like Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, which mm -hmm. is doing incredibly poorly, and despite why? having been colonized. Because and they chased the all the whites out. That's actually not true. Oh, Zimbabwe was one of the, Rhodesia true. was the only country after independence that extended what they call the hand of reconciliation to the white community to get them to stay because the whites were the ones who actually controlled all the economic power in the country. And look what happened. They drove out all the farmers, all of this forced exploit, expropriation of the land. Zimbabwe used to be self-sufficient in food. It had a wonderful agricultural export economy. Now it's a mess because they drove out the whites. It ha I know that you will see this in racial terms because it has it manifested itself in racial terms, but it's economics there. All the power, <laughs> all the economic and political power was concentrated in one small portion of the population, and when it was no longer in their interest to be there, they did leave. I, I don't want to have a conversation about uh, colonization because I, I know that is a you rabbit hole. I, I do want to ask you, further. I do yes. want to ask you about, um, look, two of the things that you've pointed to again and again in terms of American history, where there was a, a turning point, a pivotal point, in where you think the decline uh, sort of began uh, is around 1965, right? The Voting Rights Act, the Immigration Act. No, the great change was the Immigration Act of 1965. Mm -hmm. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was also a very significant change. So let me the, ask you this because you weren't here. You weren't in America no, when those were happening. So how did you, how are you processing those? How were you learning about what was happening here? You were still in Japan at the time. You we were 14 paying, or 15 at the time? I was paying no attention at the time. None at all? No. So when you came back to the States, mm -hmm. I shouldn't even say back, when you first right. came to the States, how old were you? I was, well, I first came when I was nine years old for a year, and then I came to, to stay when I was 16. When you were 16. Okay. So how were you comparing sort of life? You knew no life in America before you got here when you were 16, right? No, but how do we know about the past? Do we know about the past from reading about it, from speaking with people who were living in the past? So how did you come to learn, how did you come to hold the ideas you do about what was better about America before the Immigration Act, for example? Did you, was that from Until academic circles you were in, your friends, your family? Until 1965, the United States had an immigration policy that was specifically designed to keep the country majority white. And it had a population that was about 90% white. At that time, they had the quotas, heart, right, yes. of national origin. Yes, 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 that's right, to maintain a European population. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the Hart Seller Act, as it was called, was sold as something that was not going to change the ethnic balance. And if at that time you had told the American Congress, if you pass this law in just 70 years, whites, you who are 90% of the population, are going to become a minority, I can promise you they would never have passed that law. This was something that was foisted onto American Congress as a kind of window dressing. The American people would never have voted to become a minority. And now those who say that that was a mistake are told that they are racist, they're white supremacist, despite the fact that virtually every non-white country on earth takes for granted that its population will remain as it is and not be dispossessed, not be reduced to a minority through immigration or any other means. But the Immigration Act, as it was passed, and, and you're right at the time that it was characterized as something that wouldn't have enormous change exactly. on society at, at that time. I'm glad we agree. Uh, yeah, I know. I've, I've, I've read about it as well. Um, at the time, it was passed really with two purposes, right? One was to reunite immigrant families, um, and no. the other was to attract skilled labor. It was to actually continue to contribute to the modernization and progress of the American economy. It ended up being a family reunification bill, but the people who made use of that were not the original Europeans. And one of the most important aspects of that bill was in the context of the Cold War. The United States was competing with the Soviet Union for influence all around the Third World, and it made it easier for the Soviet Union to say, look at these horrible capitalists. They won't even let you people into their country. That was an extremely important aspect of the reason for the passage of that. Also, there had just been the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 19. So this was considered a dismantling of the kind of racial consciousness that had been traditional in the United States, but again, it was simply to be window dressing. 
the other part of that, with the abolition of the national quotas and right. the reunification of immigrant families, was to attract skilled labor. Every time America it has opened work, up or loosened it. immigration borders, it's it's been to attract the kind of labor that's been lacking. And it didn't work. Did it? We didn't get skilled labor at all. The people who have come I in the post-65. I think a lot of people would very strongly disagree with that, no, Mr. No. Taylor. Look let's, into the details. Let's the move people, on. The comparison let between me ask the, you let, about... Let me finish. The comparison between pre-65 immigrants and post-65 immigrants in terms of academic qualifications, years of schooling, there is a dramatic fall off. I That's actually you. not empirically true. Immigrants in America are more likely than Native, uh, than Americans who have uh, been here, than white Americans, to go to a four-year educational institutions. They're more likely to start businesses. They're more likely to be engines of economy in their own communities. I, that is all empirically I, true I about immigrant your communities. Pardon. You are incorrect. That is true for certain segments. The largest number who have come here by and large have been Hispanics. Hispanics, they may start businesses, but they come with an average level of education that is considerably less than that of native-born whites. You will Once have they are no, here, I would argue immigrant communities, and the data actually shows this, immigrant communities go on to complete, yes, they do, absolutely no, do. No. Second Let's, and third generation Hispanics are still way behind in terms of academic completions, likelihood to go to college. In certain selective groups, yes, it's true, people from your origin Pakistanis and Indians, they tend to come with higher educational qualifications. Hispanics certainly do not. Let's move on. I'd like to talk about, we talked a little bit about how you came to understand your identity um, in the work that you did and the places that you traveled. I'm curious how you talk about it. I, I know you talk about it in your work. But you have children, correct? Have you have children. two daughters mm -hmm. who are now adults, I'm assuming? One is 22, one is 15. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, holding the views that you do, how do you talk to them about race? Oh, I explain exactly what I think. Why would I not? And have they always been receptive to that? Have they ever challenged Generally you in your receptive, views? Yes. Uh, no. Uh, of course, they challenge me on everything. That's as they should. Do you believe that they, as your children, hold the same views that you do? By and large, I suspect that they do. Do they have friends who are non-white? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. Are you okay with that? That's their choice. I believe in complete freedom of association. But that conflicts with how you think generally society should be structured. No, it doesn't at all. I believe, again, in complete freedom of association. And when people are free to associate, they generally associate with people like themselves. That's why churches, for example, church congregations, at least 85% to 95% of the church congregations are 80 to 90% one race. Many of them are 100% one race. That's because churches are among the few institutions in America that the government hasn't tried forcibly to integrate. It's proof, once again, that when people are entirely free to choose their own associates, they prefer to be with people like themselves. And when people are entirely free, that is the way they will behave, and they should not be criticized for doing so. Now, if people wish to mix it up, I say God bless them. They, how on the other hand, should not consider themselves the moral superiors of those of us who prefer to be with people like ourselves, and the law should not be written in a way to penalize that very natural and healthy preference. You are okay with your daughters having black or Hispanic friends? If they wish to have them, they will, they're welcome to have them. I, as I say, I believe in complete freedom of association. By and large, Would you be okay it's, if like, your daughters uh, married or dated large, black or Hispanic people? I would prefer that they do not do so, but uh, I believe, again, that they should be completely free to choose, and insofar as they are free to choose, by and large, they spend their time with people like themselves, namely white people. Let me ask you about this, because you, uh, I'm assuming, have you raised them in Northern Virginia, where you live now? That's correct. Um, so I actually grew up in Northern Virginia, too, mm -hmm. and I think we probably grew up around the same time, the sort of 80s, 90s. Mm. So um, that county, Fairfax County, is in that time, it underwent enormous change, right? I saw it growing up. I'm sure you've seen it in the years that you lived there. Um, it, it's still, I think, one of the richest counties in America, yes, right? With that, one of the highest median incomes. Yes. But the, the demographics have changed quite a bit there. 
It's still uh, majority white, quite substantially majority white. Majority white. Yes, and I the think schools that they attend are still majority white. Uh, they they have the opportunity, increasingly rare for whites today, to attend public schools that are majority white. Mm-hmm. More and more whites are pulling their children out of public schools because they don't want them to be minorities. When the, when the school becomes majority Hispanic, majority black, or when you have to have 12 interpreters for the PTA meetings, white people don't feel comfortable, and they tend to move away to some place that is still white or send their children to private school. Two of the largest, two of the largest growths in terms of demographics in that area in particular have been the Hispanic population, right, That's and the Asian population. That's right? correct. The black population has mostly remained stagnant. A very small black population. Yeah. Has that informed how you see uh, the views that you hold today? I mean, in your no. own home no. county, when you see that kind of change happening, no. What do my, you? My views on race were established well before I moved to Fairfax County. Mm-hmm. But, but really, how I arrived at these views is really not very interesting. Oh, what's I actually find it fascinating. What's interesting is the views themselves. I mean, my personal experience is a boring one. And I can assure you, more and more whites, through a whole host of different kinds of experience, some radically different from mine, are arriving at exactly the same conclusions as myself. That race is a significant part of their identity, that whites are making a terrible mistake by setting in motion forces that will reduce them to a minority. And more and more whites are arriving at this view, and things will change. Whites will stand up to their own interests. This is inevitable. And I'm glad you're having this conversation, but how they arrive at those views is far less important than the fact that those views are correct. They are oh, morally well established. I strongly disagree with that. I think are, how you arrive... Let, let me finish, please. I, I, let I, me, can I finish? Please. The fact that these views are morally well established, they are in conformance with human history and recorded history and also in conformance with human nature. That is why they will prevail and that is why more and more whites are agreeing with me. It makes no difference how they arrive at these, uh, at these experiences. Some through reading, some through direct experience, some simply by looking at the world around them. These views will ultimately prevail because again, they are morally unimpeachable, they are founded in human history and also in human nature. I would disagree with several of the points that you are making, and that is fine. I understand that you hold these beliefs and that there are a certain portion of Americans who share those ideals with you. Increasingly so. I would argue it's actually very important how you came to arrive at these views. Because I find it it interesting. Because I think the process of how you come to believe what to be true is just as interesting as what you believe to be true. I think it's really uh, strictly anecdotal. The truth is much more important than how we arrive at it. The but truth in is also case, highly yes. subjective. Yes. Can so we move on to politics? Tr- no, if you there don't are mind? objective truths. There are objective truths. The race, the reality of race, for example, is an objective truth. How one arrives at that is vastly less important than the fact that it is a biological fact. It, uh, race is also as much about perception as it is about what you believe and how you self-identify. You really think so you really think that the differences I, between a pygmy and an Australian aborigine are somehow a matter of sociological optical illusion? You don't think they're biological phenomena? I believe phenomena? that in modern America, when race is absolutely as much about perception and self-identity as it is anything else, yes, you have to have a much more nuanced view than a strict ideological, moral argument as you claim that you are making. In other words, if Mr. I Taylor, I'd like, I know your time is limited and I don't want to waste it. I, I, I'd really like to move on politically. Yes. We're, we're hosting you here and I thank you for accepting our invitation um, because more and more people who share your worldview have appeared to become emboldened and speaking out more about them as you have been doing for decades now. Um, I'd like to know, first of all, you, do you support uh, Mr. Trump as president oh, during the campaign? Oh, vastly better than his alternative. Is, but is that an anti-Secretary Clinton view or is that a pro-President Trump view? I would say it's about a 50-50 expression of both. Really? Okay. Yes. So you, you've called him a sign of rising white consciousness. I think that his electoral success reflects to some <clears throat> unmeasurable degree a recognition among whites that they do have legitimate group interests. Donald Trump is not a racial nationalist. He is an American nationalist. He doesn't think in racial terms so far as I can tell, but at least to make distinctions in terms of nation is the first step to making legitimate distinctions in terms of race. So that what, is why I support him. What did you see him do or say during the campaign that said to you he was the candidate for you? 
Oh, that's obvious. He promised to send home every single illegal immigrant. He talked about perhaps forbidding Muslims to come as immigrants, at least temporarily. He promised to build a wall so that no more illegal immigrants would come. All of those steps would slow down the dispossession of whites. They would slow down the process whereby whites would be reduced to a minority. And it is slowing down that process is one that I highly, highly support. Now, I don't think that he arrived at these policies because he thinks in terms of the racial demographic future of the United States. I think he is an American patriot, and I think he has a perfectly healthy notion that any sovereign nation must be able to control its borders. He wouldn't want anybody coming into the country illegally, certainly not committing crimes, certainly not going on welfare, wherever they're from, Mexico, Great Britain, India, he wouldn't care. But he has some notion that America is a distinct country with a distinct people, and their interests should be put first. I'm Hillary not sure Clinton, why you mentioned welfare, sir. You know me? that there are more white Americans on welfare in the country than any other racial Look, group, right? they're the majority. Look, don't you realize that the no, whole I, I concept just like to, of Empirically, per capita, in the interest of objective truths, as you, as you pointed out. Central Americans are three to four times more likely to be on public assistance programs than white Americans. There are this still more well white Americans because on the public majority. assistance programs. They're they the are majority. the majority. Yes. They absolutely are the majority. What matters, what matter is per capita participation in these things. If you have percentage a of populations of 10, is what you're arguing. No, per capita participation. If Okay, let's say Central Americans are 10% of the U.S. population, but they are still three to four times more likely than whites to be on public assistance programs. Numerically, that will be a smaller number, but it shows that they are not supporting themselves the way the majority should But many should urban communities them. start out on public assistance and then move beyond it. And, and that, that is part of the process of being no, in America, it was of working towards the opportunity with the resources that you're granted. The idea of coming to the United States and putting your foot in the public trough, sucking at the public teat, is outrageous to the vast majority of Americans. They do not want foreigners waltzing into their country and going on the public dole. No country wants that. And the fact that that happens in the United States is an outrage. The fact that Donald Trump wants to put an end to that is a glorious change from his predecessors and from his possible opponent. I'd like to move on to Mr. Trump's policies. What All you right. have seen, actually, I want to ask you about this. He publicly disavowed groups that align with yours. There's a lot of overlap between the alt-right and some of the groups who self-identify as alt-right and the groups that you host and associate with at American Renaissance. President Trump publicly disavowed them. That's no surprise to me. Why do you think he did that? Because he doesn't see things in terms of race the way I do. But the you left, still continue to support him. Of course. Look at, look at his opponent. The left has this completely hysterical, hair-trigger view of what constitutes white supremacy or racism or Nazism. They think that the slightest deviation from their egalitarian fantasies puts someone in the camp of the Nazis. Donald Trump was never someone who taught, thought in terms of race, never at all. I never thought that. And the idea that somehow he was dancing to the tune of people like myself or that he was going to invite people like me into his cabinet, this was utter foolishness, but it was quite widespread among liberals who have no understanding whatsoever of those who disagree with them, even in the slightest, on these egalitarian fantasy ideas. Do you consider yourself a white nationalist? I have told you what I consider myself, a race realist and a white advocate. I don't use the term white nationalist. I know you don't use it, but yes. in terms of what white nationalism means, which is that America should be a homeland for whites, you I believe in that. that. I think whites deserve a homeland. Whites deserve a place in which they are the unquestioned majority, in which they can pursue their destiny free from the unwanted embrace of people unlike themselves. And I think all people should have that right. Do you consider we, yourself as white, a white supremacist? Just a moment. We as whites have the right to be us, and only we can be us, and we can be us only if we have a territory that is unquestionably one in which we are the majority. White supremacy is a word that should be completely retired Why? from the contemporary because a white supremacist is presumably someone who wants to rule over people of other races. No, that's not at all what it is. A white supremacist is someone who believes that whites are inherently better in some way, as you have argued, biologically or morally, than other racial groups. If you wish to define it in those terms, I think that East Asians... I think Asians, that's the way that most people no, actually no, define it. No, no. A white it. supremacist would be someone who wished to colonize Africa, who wished to enslave blacks, who wished to implement Jim Crow 
pro. That is I white supremacy. Those are but, extreme manifestations well, of that ideology. If, but if today, you want to define it, if you want to define it in terms of thinking that whites are superior to others, that doesn't that doesn't apply to me at all. I think that East Asians have higher average IQs. They have lower crime rates, lower illegitimacy rates. You could describe them in many ways as objectively superior to whites. But so you, you want also to call believe me in relation to black and Hispanic okay. communities that whites are morally and biologically I better. say nothing whatsoever about morality or biology. I can talk about individual traits. Well, I think you've that, talked well, very disparagingly me, please, about please, black please. and Hispanic communities. Can you let me finish? Really? It, you, it, it is objective that you what? have said incredibly disparaging things about black and Hispanic about, communities. I have talked about crime rates. I've talked about illegitimacy rates. I've talked about verifiable phenomena. Now, what I have said is that so let's just take about let's just talk about athletic ability. I think that blacks are probably superior to whites in many athletic res respects. In terms of intelligence, I think on average whites are superior to blacks. Again, East Asians are superior to whites. The whole idea that the races are all 100% mathematically equal, this is a leftist fantasy. So no, there no, there's you, nothing in the historical or in, the academic record that would make you, make you think such a thing. In the racial hierarchy in your mind. There's no racial uh, hierarchy. But you've already said that you believe East, Asian, East Asians to be superior to whites in many no, respects. In certain respects. I'm, all I'm saying is the races are different. They build different societies. And if Asians wish to live in the society that they they build, or if Mexicans or Argentines, if they wish to live in the society they built, that is fine. The idea of a hierarchy is alien to me. You we want have separatism preferences. is what you'd like. What Segregation. I want, I want, I have already told you what I want. Complete freedom of association. Don't you remember my telling you that? Segregation how, is some sort of mean? forcible separation. What does that mean for communities that are already integrated? You, you seem to be arguing that it's unnatural for people to be living integrated in for, that way. Well, are you I, arguing for segregation? I, look, please pay attention to what I'm saying. I've already told you, if people wish to mix it up, God bless them. Let them do so. But those who wish to be separate should have that opportunity, too. How? I've already said that. How does that happen? How? It happens spontaneously. Look at the way Americans live today. Do you think they live in a sort of a random race, completely oblivious manner? Of course not. Why are there black neighborhoods? Why are there Asian neighborhoods? Why are there white neighborhoods? That expresses the natural preferences of human beings. But Mr. Taylor, why is it that, no major, why is it that in if, all... If I may, no, no major changes in our, in our community have happened spontaneously. If you look at the arc of American history, if you look at the arc of American history, what you've had is groups advocating, as you were arguing that white people should be advocating for their, for their interests, as if they're separate and vastly uh, from other racial groups, but no community has just spontaneously gained equal access to opportunities or civil rights. That's come as a result of mass ground level movements. That's come as a result of advocacy, of legislators. So of, what? So, so the kind of change you're arguing for, you're saying should happen spontaneously. That's it impossible. Would, no, it would happen spontaneously if people were just left alone. The example I gave you of church congregations being self-segregated naturally and spontaneously and happily. Why is it that in lunch rooms all around the country and schools, people s automatically self-segregate? The Hispanics sit here, the blacks sit there, the whites sit there, and the Asians sit over there. This is because they're expressing the natural tribalism of human beings. Let uh, hold on, yeah. hold on. Let us accept this. Let us set aside this foolish idea that we can build a society in which race can be made not to matter. The communists tried to build a society in which selfishness was going to be abolished. This was a, an abysmal misreading of human nature. And look at the misery that resulted. We are making a very similar mistake. We are trying to mold human nature as some wish it might be rather than recognizing it as it is. We are far better off taking humans as they are and building a society that reflects their nature rather than trying to force them into some artificial mold that meets some egalitarian fantasy. Let me ask you about people who may share your views and then be inspired to act in some way, who may think that the change to protect what they perceive as their white identity under attack isn't coming fast enough and they have to act to do something. What do you have to say to those people? Let's imagine that I am a fervent believer in the danger of climate change. And let us say that I've made a career out of talking about the dangers of burning fossil fuels. And someone takes my ideas and goes into ExxonMobil and shoots up all the executives 
Am I to blame? So instead of dealing with hypotheticals, I'd actually like to talk about things that have happened. People who do share your views, who have been acting in violent ways. And tell me one. Name one. Dylan Roof, for example. We have no idea whether or not he has anything to do with my views. His manifesto actually made direct reference to a council of which you are a spokesman. The Council of Conservative Citizens. I acted as a spokesman on that occasion, but I think the parallel with climate change is a perfect one. Excuse me, Mr. Taylor. So there is a direct correlation there between a man who walked into a black church and shot to death nine people and wrote about his motivation for doing so, referencing an organization of which you are a member. Do you feel no responsibility for his actions? None whatsoever. Why not? Because what I speak is the truth. I think, don't forget, the very first thing that prompted him and said, he said his life was never the ch- never the going to be the same after that was the discovery of what actually happened in the Trayvon Martin Zimmerman encounter. He had been told that this was some sort of exploitative racial profiling by Zimmerman of a black guy. He discovered that contrary to what he'd been told, the black person had attacked the white person, and the white person had to shoot him in self-defense. This was big news to him that he discovered on the Internet, not from people like ABC or the other networks that were describing this. He had to go to the Internet to find this out. When he went to the Council of Conservatives, he discovered the truth about black-on-white crime. That he, was what he shocked read, him. He read the Council of Conservative Citizens' version of the truth, Many of those crime numbers, and the same way the American Renaissance has published them, are very selectively organized and presented. That's absolutely true. Whites are much more likely in American society to be killed by other whites, just as blacks are much more likely to be killed by other blacks. I have never said that. The myth of fear mongering that whites are somehow more likely to be killed by blacks is just not, it's not empirically true, sir. American Renaissance have never said such a thing. Never, ever. Don't put words in my mouth. Actually, try reading what we have written rather than. And reading what others have written about us, what we have made very clear, every year in the United States, there are about 650,000 crimes of violence across black and white racial lines. Of that number, what percentage do you think are committed by blacks against whites and whites against blacks? Just have a guess. I, I, I'm not going to play a numbers game with you, sir, because I, I, I think that because numbers can be know. manipulated. No. Numbers can be absolutely no. be manipulated. The empirical fact is that whites are more likely to be killed by other whites I and blacks are more likely that. to be killed by other blacks. I have never denied and the that. percentages are different because whites comprise so much more of American society. I will supply you with the answer. Of those 650,000 crimes of violence that cross racial lines involving blacks and whites, Blacks commit 85% of them. It means that a black person is about 40 times more likely to attack a white in some manner rather than the other way around. This, I think uh, anyone out there who wants to look into the numbers. No, sir, I I don't want to argue the data. You're not going to let me tell you the data. No, because you don't want to hear the data, do you? I'd like to get back to the original point, which you haven't yet answered, which is what would you say to these people who commit violent acts in the name of the ideas that you espouse? I would say, don't do it. You are being fooled. Stop right away. Never do it again. Fooled of course, that's by what whom? Fools. They're fools to take violent action in something that will only make the situation worse. And again, just because I say something that is true, if I'm a believer in any cause, there are people who are opposed to abortion. There are people who are favor abortion. They sometimes commit acts of violence. Does that mean the people who take their positions are somehow, uh-oh, I must have been wrong because some idiot off his rocker acted on my ideas and committed you an act of violence? people who shoot other people in the name of white pride or white nationalism are idiots? They're absolutely off their rocker. Of course, yes. I repudiate them unquestionably. Do you, I, I don't, you feel no responsibility whatsoever for espousing these ideas and, and <laughs> acting people to... Are you ask, asking that? Are you asking that? You, I am. I am. Look, if you consider yourself, you've devoted your career to this. You spend a great amount of resources and intellect and time and energy arguing these ideas. Yes. And then people act on them. Dylan Roof is one person 
who has committed an abominable series of murders because he discovered something about crime that you people, the mainstream media, never told him about. He discovered truths that had been hidden from him by the mainstream media. He was outraged by this. He then delved what into... What about well, the let, Come on, let me finish. No, you've made this. Look, you've, you've, no. you've, you've answered then, this already, no. sir. You've he made then, this case. He then delved into the Internet. We don't know where else he went. He spent a lot of time on the Internet. We don't know we where know. he went. And he discovered that you people have been deceiving him and the American public, and that drove him crazy. We know what he has said in his manifesto. Yes, we do. Let's talk about religion. Because in addition to race, um, you've said some things about how you view different religions, a racial, a racial, religious diversity in America as well. You said that you don't believe that we need any more Muslims here. No. Is it fair to say that you support uh, Mr. Trump's proposal to ban people from Muslim countries coming I to the States? I think we need no more Muslims. I don't think Muslims add anything to the country, and I think that they are a net negative, a clear net negative. Do you support the idea of a Muslim registry for Muslims who are already here? Oh, no, not necessarily. No, I don't think a registry is particularly useful. They're here, and uh, uh, no, I just don't want any more coming. I mean, after all, why do we need more people who insist on foot baths, who insist on women-only swimming hours, who insist on stopping the assembly line so they can pray, who refuse to handle pork, who refuse to let people in their taxes if they're coming with a dog under their arm? This kind, this is precisely the kind of diversity that is a source of tension and conflict, as all all of the diversity we're supposed to be celebrating is. How many and beso Muslims besides do which, you know? hmm? oh, I know so several Muslims. You think, do you, you? think, you think I've never met a Muslim? Look, I've spent months and months in Muslim countries. I probably have more experience with Muslims than the vast majority of Americans. I'm asking about American Muslims because I think American Muslims are actually quite different. Studies have shown that their social views, their cultural views, their level of assimilation, their level of opportunity and success in America is actually quite different. And, from they, Muslim and, they never, and they never want to stop the assembly line so they can pray. They never want to have foot baths in universities. They never want to have women-only swimming pool hours. Is that what you're telling me? No, I'm telling you that the vast majority of the 3.3 million American Muslims mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. assimilate incredibly well and have done remarkable things in American society. And, and I think, disagree strongly with your idea that you they've contributed those, you nothing. You think whatever they've accomplished couldn't have been accomplished by non-Muslims who would not have caused the problems I've just been describing? I, th I think it's a false. No, sir. I think it's a false equivalency to say that they are causing problems that some other community would not have, who or else? that white Americans who, would wait, not have. Wait, who else? Who else <laughs> wants to ban pork from the cafeteria? Who else wants to say, okay, men, you can't swim at these hours? Who else is saying that? I think anecdotally, if you create an argument in that way, then yes, you would see a structural problem with Muslim immigration. Yes, I see a structural problem. I, I, see, I, I, I understand I that see absolutely nothing that Muslims, qua Muslims, have done for America that any other group could not have done equally well or better and would not have brought these problems I described. And I haven't even mentioned the number of Muslims who take it upon themselves to try to kill us. Can I ask you something? What is You've it? asked me many things already. I'd like to ask you another. Go right ahead. What is it like for you to sit across from me like this? You, you know I'm Muslim. You know I'm first-generation American. Hmm. What is it like for you to say these things to someone who you know does not share the same views and, and could even take a lot of these things personally? Well, you have been saying things about me. You are accusing me of complicity in murder. Do you think that this I've goes one way? I've not accused you of any of those things. Indeed, I've asked you, you if you feel responsibility for no, the things you, that you say. And you have suggested that I am somehow responsible for the murder of nine innocent black African Americans. That's what you have suggested. I didn't suggest that. I asked how right. I asked how you view that, whether or not you I feel take responsibility, no and responsibility. you said you don't. I take no responsibility for speaking the truth. No, none whatsoever. I Well, let's put it this way. I take full responsibility for speaking the truth. Those who may be unhinged and act in violent, crazy ways on the basis of the truth, for those people I take no responsibility whatsoever. Now, the fact that you are a first-generation non-white American, an immigrant, you are part of the dispossession of my people, because you happen to be such a person isn't going to make me change my views at all. Why would it? Let me ask you about anti-Semitism. All right. Many people who share your worldview uh, and your racial views have very strong anti-Semitic feelings as well. But you don't. 
you have actually said that you think Jewish people are okay and that they, they look white to you. So uh, why do you break from a lot of people who share the same views on race that you do in that way when it comes to Jews in America? Well, ask them why they think what they do. Uh, I, if you want to know why my views are different, I can tell you what my views are, and that is uh, you've, already, you've already described them. I think that uh, European Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, many of them are patriotic men of the West. I know quite a number who share my views practically 100 percent on racial questions, and I do not see them as an enemy. I think that they are uh, very much allies in the struggle for maintaining Western civilization and Western man in North America. What about non-European Jews? Sephardic Jews, they're more Middle Eastern. I wouldn't consider them. It all depends. Uh, there are some difficult cases, but by and large, Sephardic Jews, Middle Eastern Jews, Persian Jews, no, they don't seem quite to me. What about Arab Christians? <sighs> I haven't really given the, the, the matter much consideration, but I suspect they are Arabs. The fact that they are Christians doesn't make them white. You can be Christian and be a Congolese. So is white for you, it's more about European, pure yes. European ancestry, yes. not it's, about perception or how you present in society. For example, people of mixed race, someone you might right. look at and think looks very white, but mm -hmm. actually has a mixed racial heritage. I'm not going to be giving people 23andMe tests. Uh, it's not as though we have at the point of deciding, okay, who's white, who's not. I don't feel particularly strongly about this. For the most part, we have no difficulty figuring out who is white and who's not. The idea that this is somehow an impossible sheep from the goats kind of undertaking, I think that's just a fantasy that people indulge in when they want to make trouble for the idea that you could establish a European-oriented country. We would have no difficulty doing Do that. Do you know that you have pure European descent? What difference would it make if I didn't? In fact, I do. I've actually done this 23andMe thing. You've taken the answer. Thing. Oh, yes. really? Yes, what did yes. it show? I'm 100% European. Oh, well. As many of us are. Don't sound surprised. Many of us are 100% European. Uh, I'm not surprised. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know that you've taken the test, though, to, to I, prove. Uh, I actually stumbled onto it, uh, a free offer to do it. And so I took that free offer up. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Again, I want to be respectful of your time. So I'd like to talk a little bit, uh, just very quickly, about how we move forward now. Um, mm -hmm. There is, uh, you talked a little bit about, you think, how spontaneously people will sort of speak out for what, or advocate for uh, the best interests of their own community. But for the people who listen to you, um, mm -hmm. for the people who read your work, what, what is it that you are asking them to do? How do you think that your white identity will be protected? I've already described, whites must have some institution, community, territory in which they are the unquestioned majority, in which their culture is recognized as the one that is central to the way that community operates. And it's not just Americans. It's true all around the world. The French should have, a, have the right and the duty to remain French, Germans, Italians, just as Pakistanis have the right to remain Pakistani. If non-Pakistanis, say Indians, you know, d if diversity is such a great thing for America, why not for Pakistan? Why not bring in some Hindus, some Indians? You know, your country, your original country, fell apart over diversity. This is it my original country, sir. Okay, your parents' original country. It fell apart over diversity. The Pashtuns uh, just couldn't get along with the Bengalis, could they? The Punjabis, the Pashtuns, the Bengalis, diversity tore that country in two. As diversity so frequently tears countries, communities, institutions in two. The idea that diversity is somehow a strength is one of these so obviously wrong fantasies. It's astonishing that it's gained the kind of currency that it has. You and argued this is, for is, what you think sort of the ideal place in American society is. You think that America 1963, 64 is Look, what? Uh, no. There no, is you've never, put a finer point no. on this before. When you've said, you know, the racial makeup of America, the way America was structured, it was that is sort of your ideal. ideal? It was far from ideal. There was this indigestible group of blacks that should never have been brought to this country. That was a colossal mistake. The idea... The slave trade was a colossal yes, mistake. A, of course it was a colossal mistake. 
And the idea Mr. that... Mr. Taylor, that, every... Come on, come on. Let me, uh, Please. You, you really love to interrupt me, don't you? No, I, I love idea, to have a conversation. The idea, the idea that uh, somehow all of the people coming to America now from all around the world, be they Hmong, be they Vietnamese, be they Middle Easterners, will assimilate just the way the Swedes and the Germans and the Poles did. It's once again completely ignoring American history. We've always had a group that did not assimilate, that came here long before the European ethnics, American Indians and blacks. They did not assimilate, and they haven't assimilated because of race. Biology is one of the most difficult, most of the time an impossible barrier to assimilation. And so to draw parallels between, say, uh, oh, Iraqis, Afghanis, and say, look, look, the Italians fit in, they'll fit in just fine. Afghanis that is, are the, is the money, Afghans are the people. Let me ask you this, in terms of racial groups and in terms of the arc of American history, mm. Whatever time period you'd like to get back to or whatever your vision for a future for a future America right. in which the whites remain the majority. Yes. It's it's a bit of select. It's like a very revisionist sort of view to look back on all the contributions made by minority communities here. I mean, the black, you may hold the view that the slave trade was absolutely wrong, Do which I'm sure most thing? people who are morally upright would agree. But it was it was actually black slave labor that made the American economy what it was. Oh, and then it was Hispanic labor that contributed to everything from agriculture on the West Coast and down sorry, south to sorry. to the no to the auto industry in Detroit and beyond. It was right. Asian labor that created so much of the infrastructure that then propelled the American economy forward. Every you, group that's you, come you, here you really, has made really America what it is today. You really believe that? I absolutely know that to why? be true. Look, if blacks were so crucial to the development of America, why is it that the North was far more prosperous than the South? The North would had practically no slaves at all. Why was it so much more industrialized and wealthier than the slaveholding South? It's they because were different economies, Mr. Taylor. <laughs> right. And but you're telling me, you're telling you're me. You're telling me the economy, economy of the South wasn't different from the economy of the North? Of course it was different. Absolutely. In fact, it was held back by slave labor, which is an extremely inefficient way to mobilize labor. People would come to the North and say, look, if you just hired Irish navvies to do your stuff and fire them when you're finished, you'd be so much better off than looking looking after them when they're old, looking after them when they're young. And there are many studies that suggest that this is absolutely true. The presence of blacks was not a benefit to the South. It was by no means some sort of economic boost. Do you think the South just couldn't have developed without slaves? Do you really think that? Well, I guess you we'll think never white people know, couldn't have done it because a great crime was committed in American history, and I, you can't erase it once it's been done. But let yes. me ask you this: When you look at American society now, I know you've mm -hmm. talked a lot about the rest of the world too. When you look at American society now, every corner of power and influence—political, financial, educational, social—is still dominated by white people. For how long? So so your concern is more projecting forward look, to the demographic look. changes you see coming. Why, is that is that right? Why on earth would whites wish to become a minority? Tell well, me that. But why, why why do you see everything? Why do you see identity and the access to opportunity and resources and all the things that America is built on? Why do you see that as a zero sum game? It's why not. why does the success of a minority community necessarily take away from the success of a white community? Do you think when an Asian is admitted to Yale, that doesn't take away a place that might have been filled by a white? When an African-American gets a Oscar nomination, you think that's not an Oscar nomination that might have gone to someone else? Every single one of these is a shoving match. It's a, push me. it's a pushing match that is all based on people's identification on the basis of race. They want more. There are limited resources. And somehow the idea we're all going to hold hands and it's all going to be wonderful for all of us doesn't work that way. But the argument that somehow white identity, white power, white influence is under attack rests on the idea that somehow all these minority communities will overtake white identity and that they will then um, impose their own views and, and that they're somehow in, in vast, in, in, in stark contrast to whatever white Americans want, which is, it's, it's not proven to be true. It is obvious what they're doing. I had a conversation with Jorge Ramos the other day. You know who he, who he is. He's Univision yes, anchor. Yeah. He says, look, Americans are all the same. But still, because Hispanics are 13 percent of the population, we should have 13 percent of the senators, 13 percent of the representatives in Congress. 
all racial groups think in those terms because they think in national racial ethnic identity. And all of those gains so, come at the losses of whites. See, but why can't you see that as them just wanting equal representation? Why is that a bad thing? Obviously, they want equal representation. They might want more representation. My point is, when you get not to this... not what they no, might want. I'm asking what they do want. They want equal representation. Even America as it exists today does look, not have equal representation in the halls of influence and power for its minority communities. That is part of the advocacy. Of that course. is why there, as you referenced at the beginning, that's why there are black advocacy groups and Hispanic advocacy groups and Muslim ad advocacy groups that's because right. they don't have equal representation. Because they all want more. They all want more. And it all comes you at the expense of whites. You are imposing that on them, though. You well, are speculating about oh, a very nefarious sense. intention among minority communities. No. Look, and you're also building that idea on the fact that these communities can't live together with equal representation. The point is, this is precisely what I've been describing, the ultimate dispossession of whites. It will come culturally, politically, artistically, musically, demographically. You are describing the very thing that you would probably never permit or never countenance if we were discussing some non-white country. Imagine, imagine whites or any other non-Mexican group were pouring into Mexico, more likely to commit crimes, more likely to go on welfare, demanding ballot papers papers in English. School, hold on, let me finish. I would never let, argue that Mexico finish. is the same as America. The, oh. the countries were founded in very different ways. They were right. created in very different ways with, with different ideals. In other words, what you're saying is because America and all white countries are inhabited by white people, dispossession is good for us, but it doesn't work for anybody else. No, That's sir, what you're arguing. I don't see it as dispossession. I see it as an of expansion of don't. equality. Of I see it as an expansion don't. of civil rights and equality on, on the very found, the very ideas on which the country was founded. Because America, no, as you're wrong. America as you are talking about it, is a stagnant identity. It is a place in time. Look. But America, in the way that it's always existed, no. is an ideal. No. It's a it's it's a it's a it's a it's progress. It look, is a look, it's look, practice. The very first citizenship law passed in 1790 by the very first Congress, reserved naturalization to free white persons of good character. They wanted a white country. They wanted a white country. They continued to want a white country until 1965. What you're saying is completely revisionist. The idea that America was founded on, it's up for grabs. Come on, come on. That's complete I've nonsense. I never said it was up for grabs. Well, I that's implied that practice, in what you're saying. The idea of America in no. terms of working towards an ideal of equality in which all men are created equal in which all communities have access to the same resources, the chance for life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, right. that is the ideal. I, I no, know very well our founding no. fathers were slave owners, yes, and I know and very well that they probably did not imagine that America would be today what it is. They However, would have been appalled by the idea. Furthermore, what you're, saying, yet, what you're saying is somehow whites were about to choke to death on their own homogeneity when people like yourself kindly arrived with diversity and saved us from ourselves. No, we built a wonderful country that your ancestors could not have been. That is why people like you come here. And the more you come in larger numbers, you will change the country my ancestors built into something else. And it is completely normal for me to wish to oppose that. Mr. Taylor, I've taken enough of your time. Thank you very much for being here. I think it's fair to say that we see the world very differently, and maybe even human nature very differently. But I do thank you for coming here and sharing your views and honesty with us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.